17 years ago, this man left the farm fields of Pennsylvania to strike it rich on the bottom of the ocean. Until now, he has met with total failure. He hunts a coral wilderness located 85 miles off the coast of the Dominican Republic. His quarry, the Nuestra Señora Concepcion, the richest treasure ship ever to sail out of Spain. One night in 1641, she sank somewhere here on the Silver Shoals. Now she lay in her grave, buried beneath three centuries of accumulated coral. In her holes are tons of silver, gold, and jewels, worth at least $200 million. That first coin instantly made Bert Weber an American success. A new home rises out of Pennsylvania's Lehigh Valley. It's for his wife Sandy who waited for this as long as he did. It was a long time coming, half a lifetime in fact. But now it was here, all of it, money enough to buy land and build a home to ensure a college education for his daughter Gretchen and their three sons. And for Bert Weber in particular, money to buy time. Time to spend at home, watch his kids grow, and to get to know his neighbors. Yes, it was the fulfillment of the American dream. Local boy makes good against impossible odds. But success hadn't come without a price, and Bert Weber well remembers. His dream of sunken treasure actually took root when he was a high school senior. From a flooded quarry, he brought up six slot machines. Each was filled with silver dollars. It was a promising beginning, but 17 years later, after searching for treasure from the Florida Keys to South America, Bert Weber is no closer to his goal. He has come here to Sevilla, where he hopes to pick up the trail of the Concepcion. Despite repeated failure, his dream of sunken treasure remains, but with one vital difference. Now deeply in debt and the father of four, he is chasing it with a quiet desperation. So he has come to the Spanish archives where all clues relating to the lost treasure of the Concepcion may be found. All clues but one. In 1687, an American named William Phipps aboard a ship called the Henry found the wreck and took away a small fraction of her treasure. Phipps kept a daily log that would undoubtedly contain the exact location of the Concepcion. But that log, the log of the Henry, has been lost for over 300 years. Nevertheless, Weber is confident that the archive contains enough pieces to the puzzle. And with colleague Jack Haskins, a master tracer of missing ships, he searches for clues among the testimony of some 200 passengers and crewmen who survived the wreck of the Concepcion. For years, Bert and Jack were friendly rivals. They had often worked on different expeditions in search of the same wreck. But now they had come together for what may be Bert's last treasure hunt. Always the search begins here, in Sevilla's Archive of the Indies, the repository for all information relating to the Spanish treasure fleets of the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. It has been estimated that one-third of the world's mined gold lies at the bottom of the ocean. Well, the clues to much of that gold can be found here. Listen to this. They threw all this silver and disks of gold off the side of the ship into these crevices and crannies of coral 
And you know, Phipps probably never got this. In the Phipps accounts, they never say anything about salvage they on top of the reef. They don't say a thing about it, reef, but they the do reefs. say, remember, Sir John was looking for stuff on top of the reef, and he couldn't find anything. This bears totally different light on the whole thing. That wouldn't even be pertinent to the main hall. No. The treasure that Phipps right. had ex access to. He never would have seen this, especially after 46 years. It's undoubtedly grown right in. I don't think Phipps ever got it. I think that is fantastic. The story has persisted for years that there's a mountain of silver out there someplace on Silver Shoal. Six months later, Weber has gathered the necessary funds from a consortium of American investors, secured a salvage license from the Dominican Republic, and was on his way to the Silver Shoals. This was his most ambitious project. If he failed this time, he'd be marked forever as a loser. But the thought of failure was as far away as his home in Pennsylvania, which is the birthplace of his close friend, Bob Coffey, who would act as his dive master and second in command. Another close friend was engineer Harry Wyman, also from Pennsylvania. Don Summers, fresh off a Missouri farm, had yet to prove himself. Not so for the sturdy, dependable Duke Wong, who had been with Bert for seven years. Retired Navy officer John Barrier filled out the nucleus of Bert's 12-man crew. No treasure hunter was ever better prepared to chase the sun or to fathom the mysteries of the 41-mile-long Silver Shoals, where the Concepcion lay in her grave, somewhere along the eastern end, at a place called Half Moon Reef. The weather was kind those first days out on the reef, and Bird and his lead divers took full advantage as they surveyed the coral heads like hunters getting the feel of unfamiliar terrain. They could not help but admire the reef's beauty, nor could they dismiss its awesome desolation as it stretched endlessly some 85 miles from the nearest land. Thirty-seven, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty-nine, forty, thirty-nine. The search officially began when a small fiberglass instrument called a magnetometer was put over the side. 37, get over to the head of the Designed to measure the Earth's magnetic field and to produce digital readouts on the surface, the magnetometer was towed around each and every coral head while Weber called out the readings. 39. Weber was looking for breaks in the magnetic pattern of the reef that would reveal the presence of iron anchors, cannons, or ship's fittings. 45, 48, 54, 62, drop it! Phase two called for Weber to descend to those areas of the reef that produced high readings on the magnetometer. And with another device called a metal detector, he would scan every inch of the bottom. Each time he picked up a trail, he would follow it with the beating hope that it would lead to the Concepcion. but each time it would turn out to be the remains of another vessel. Each wreck was interesting, but once Weber concluded it was not the Concepcion, he would leave it and look for another grave. The inevitable bad weather finally blew in from the northwest, and all activity was brought to standstill. 
While the crew rested or made repairs, Weber attended to his log. 37 days on the reef. Six wrecks found. No sign of the Concepcion. We're suffering from some kind of food poisoning. Coffee thinks it's the fish we catch from the reef. The weather persists like a bad dream. Coffee and Long try to survey the reef anyway. Negative results. Morale is heading south. We need the sun. On the 21st day, the sun finally came out. But Bert Weber remained subdued. He had lost valuable time and funds were running dangerously low. He had the feeling a gambler knows when the tide has turned against him. Where was she? Give me the metal detector. Okay. I want to stay in that sand pocket over there, the proximity where we had the magnets. I'll see you later. All right, find something. Weber and his crew worked furiously now, for they still had hundreds of coral heads to survey. He knew that the Concepcion would be a weak magnetic target, since Haskins' research had shown that she had shed her anchors before striking the shoals that dark night in 1641. 39. 39. 42. 42. 44. 44. On and on, mile after mile, the magnetometers searched the shoals for that one clue. We have 42,000. 738, 39, 48, 52, 11, 53, 50, 49, 47. A mixture of exhaustion and anxiety turned Weber's nights into ordeals. While half a world away, Jack Haskins searched the archives in Savini. He was sure that the log of the Henry, the ship chartered by Phipps, would contain the exact location of the Concepcion. But so far, it remained among the missing. Finally, on May 27th, Weber wrote in his log, at this point it can only be concluded that the Concepcion's remains do not present a detectable target to the magnetometer. And so after five months, Almost a half million dollars and 1,891 coral heads. Bert Weber regretfully called it a day. So Bert Weber packed up his broken dreams and went home to Anvil, Pennsylvania. There in a rented two-family house, he stayed awake nights caught between his dreams of sunken treasure and the reality of a wife and four children with no job and no money. He vowed that if he failed this time, his treasure hunting days would be over. But the pull of 16 years was too strong to ignore. Confused and a little bitter, Weber took long walks with his wife, Sandy, who for 15 years had raised his children and rode on the wings of his dreams. One day, a letter arrived in the afternoon mail. It was from Peter Earle, an English author writing a book on the Concepcion. And there in the second paragraph were the magic words, I have found the log of the Henry. It's in the Kent archive in Maidstone, just 50 miles south of London.
As Bert and Jack rode through the English countryside, they were filled with a cautious optimism. They felt sure that author Peter Earle's letter was accurate, that the log of the Henry did in fact exist and was waiting for them in the Kent Archive in Maidstone. What they did not know was whether it contained the exact location of the Concepcion. They were both well aware that many an old document does not survive the centuries fully intact. Had some child, while playing in a musty attic on a rainy afternoon a hundred years ago, idly ripped out the very page they were looking for? Or had the page simply disintegrated through the attacks of time and neglect? Well, they were going to find out soon enough, as their train hurtled through the last miles to Maidstone. Less than 48 hours after Weber had received the letter, he and his colleague Jack Haskins stepped off the train in Maidstone and were met by the man who had resurrected their hopes. It was a meeting that promised to make history. And there in the small reading room of the Kent Archive, Weber was to meet his historical counterpart, William Phipps. The book was in perfect condition. He could scarcely believe it. The lost log of the Henry, the ship that carried Phipps when he discovered the Concepcion. As Earl translated the archaic language that traced the Henry's voyage through the West Indies, Weber mentally rode her decks as she neared her destination on the Silver Shoal. And then Interport Plata. Now, oh, here we are. Now we're getting excited. Here's the first day of the search. This morning, after sunrising, our boat and canoe went to the east end of the reef, okay? Searched down along the north side. That means they went along the, the windward side. The windward side. That's right. Yeah. At four in the afternoon, the boat and canoe returned again, having searched at least six miles in length. Six miles. Six miles. That, that's the precise length of the uh, half moon reef. That's the whole reef. Yeah. The half moon reef is exactly yeah. six right. miles in length. That's the first day. Right. Thursday the 20th. Now, this is, this is the absolute key. She bears from our ship, east be south, a half south, about three miles off. The westmost end of the reef in sight, and the eastmost end, southeast by east, a half south. south. By east, uh, yes, uh, you know what this, they, they backed up. They reached the end of the six mile yeah. track, and then they, they backed up towards right. the southeast. When that, when those coordinates oh, give to you, put us right in here. We, we went over it. Mm -hmm. According to this, we've had, that's it. That is it. It's got to be the half moon reef. Oh, absolutely. It's got to be. Bert, you know what it means. <laughs> yes, sir. So now they had what they came for. The vital statistic that promised to lead them to the end of their search. Thanks to Peter Earle, the Kent Archive, and a sequence of extremely fortuitous events, the only thing that remained was the not-so-simple matter of finding the wreck. But they were close now, closer than they'd ever been. And Bert Weber was beginning to smell success. It is late November, 1978. Bert Weber has persuaded his backers to finance a second expedition. And after receiving an extension on his salvage lease from the Dominican Republic, he is on his way to the Silver Shoals. But this time, the search is narrowed considerably. Thanks to the information contained in the log of the Henry, Weber's field of exploration has been reduced from the six miles of coral known as Half Moon Reef to a small area toward the eastern end of the formation. As they approach the reef, it is a new site for young Jim Nace, a fresh recruit from Pennsylvania. Another new member of the crew is Bert's baby, a portable magnetometer said to be ten times as sensitive as any in the world. Adapted for underwater use by Weber himself, the $17,000 tool can be operated by a single diver and positioned within inches of the base of a coral head. 
Weber knows from experience that the standard magnetometer was ineffective when searching for the Concepcion. He and his investors are betting everything that this device will do the job. Okay. Line's clear? Yep, yep. let go. Let go. Put her down about uh, 10 feet and tie it off. All right, I'll do the first swim, Bob. And if I don't encounter any anomalies, then uh, you take over on the second the second run. And make sure if you do have to come down to release me on the second swim that you take your watch off on account of the magnetic effect. With the rubber raft anchored squarely in the center of the area outlined in the Henry Log, Weber carefully joined himself to his pet creation. Besides producing digital readouts, this magnetometer would emit a sonic message similar to the crackling of a Geiger counter. If the device's sensor detected metal under the coral, its response would be emphatic. Thus, on the morning of November 24, 1978, Bert Weber moved cautiously toward his final moment of truth. Navigating through this maze of coral heads was no simple task. And to keep Weber from getting lost, Jim Nace hovered on the surface and hammered out a directional code on his knife handle. Two hits go right, one hit go left. The day wore on, and the magnetometer's monotone never changed. The next morning progressed without incident. And as the sun approached its zenith over Half Moon Reef, Weber began to experience early signs of frustration. <coughs> then that first exultant screech of discovery and Weber calmly signaled Nace to descend and mark the spot of the hit. They would investigate it later, but now Weber swam on looking for a pattern of hits that would signify something big. A second hit, not 50 feet from the first. Now Weber responded. And before Nace could descend, he was gone like a shark on scent. It was too soon to even guess what it was, but there was something there, all right. Something old and buried deep beneath the coral. Get some more gnarly burgers. Got a hot spot. OK, OK. Weber found the first tangible clue, the neck of an olive jar, origin Spanish. Then Nace found a ballast stone, smooth and rounded, from the stream beds of the Spanish Pyrenees. A pottery shard, early 17th century, Spanish. And then perhaps with the luck of youth, 
Jim Nace handed Bert Weber a piece of his dream. That is it. Look at the cross. First going. Fantastic. You see it? Here, here. <laughs> Give me your tank. Come on. Get, get some more. Get Pull some the more. ballast rock over. It was right under the rock. So this was to be Weber's moment of truth after all. To be frozen in memory and shared with Bob Coffey, Duke Long, and Jim Nace, who brought him luck. But the question remained, how much luck? Well, Weber would soon find out just how much treasure still lay in the Concepcion's grave. February 24th, 1979. Project Concepcion moves to a new rhythm as Weber is determined to find out just how much treasure lies on the bottom of the Silver Shore. Joining him for this leg of the expedition is underwater cinematographer Stan Waterman, who will help put Bert's story on film. Waterman's enthusiasm and knowledge of the sea quickly engages Weber, and immediately a professional kinship is struck between the two men. A ship coming in here from the windward in a storm and hitting these heads would be like hitting a telephone pole. Yeah. The depths yeah. between of these course. lily pad type formations is uh, 7 to 10 fathoms. The average about 45 to 55 feet. It reminds me a little bit of a pinball machine. <laughs> Some of those ships must have come, you know, in between these bumpers here. We what? use that same expression with what we found as far as the scatterings of the Concepcion. Of course, the wreck is in two sections, and just as you said, she came pinballing right through, bouncing right. from reef to reef until she finally settled and then broke in half. It was a pretty exciting berth. The El Dorado <laughs> underwater, the this treasure is, pit. This is it. I wait a long time to reach this spot. When they reach the site, everything is already in full swing. This is the power plant for the entire salvage operation. A gasoline fuel compressor draws fresh air through these pipes and pumps it down some 50 feet to the divers and their machinery through a series of hoses. My 30th year of diving, and I've never seen the look of silver or gold or anything else underwater. First time? First time. It's going to be an exciting time. Maybe the madness will be on me, and I'll just stay on with you. <laughs> As Weber and Waterman made their descent, visibility began to diminish as great clouds of coral dust billowed up from the bottom. When they reached the wreck site, the scene was almost unreal. There were Coffee, Long, Wyman, and the rest. Yet they didn't seem like the same men at all. In some 30 years of diving, Waterman had never seen anything quite like it. Everyone moved through the gloom with a silent purpose as though they were players in someone's dream. There was Harry Wyman operating a jackhammer. A few yards away, Don Summers was lifting big pieces of coral and placing them in a large steel basket. Over in another corner, Jim Nace sliced through a stubborn neck of coral with a pneumatic chainsaw. Duke Long held a large black tube called a venturi, which sucked sand and small rocks off the bottom like a heavy-duty vacuum cleaner. And there, back at the head of the site, a large rubber bag was being inflated with air from a tank operated by coffee. As it rose toward the surface like a hot air balloon, it carried away the steel basket that Summers had filled with rocks and chunks of coral. While John Berrier towed it with a lanyard, 
Duke Long guided it off to the side of the trench, and Coffey lowered it to the dumping area by releasing air through a valve. The excavation would go on for months, but already a good deal of the coral jungle had been cleared, and the handiwork of a millennium had been split, pried, and torn apart. Many more tons of coral would still have to be moved, but after 300 years, the tomb of the Concepcion had finally been opened. The coins were found everywhere, in a mound of sand, locked in a piece of coral, under a ledge, or stratified like a limestone shelf. Piece by piece, the treasure began to mount as the Venturis cleared away the debris of ages. The miners would go wherever the trail of coins led them, removing huge pieces of coral as they went, forever lengthening, broadening, and deepening the trench. Always the excavation work was extremely dangerous. One careless mistake could easily cause a fatality. And as Weber well knew, no such underwater project had ever been completed without costing at least one life. The coins kept coming, one after the other, each worth hundreds, perhaps thousands of dollars on the open market. But the grave of the Concepcion offered other treasures as well. Like this priceless olive jar that had been lodged in a wall of coral for over 300 years. While Weber pondered how to recover it intact, the business of mining silver went on as usual. Bob Coffey finds more than 200 coins fused together by time and the sea. Finally, Weber recovers the jar, but it is filled with coral and its weight makes his trip to surface a long and tiring one. Christ! Look at that! I didn't think you were going to make it! Okay, take it easy. <laughs> Pull my legs back. Okay, I got you. Got it? That's like something out of an ancient Greek archaeological site. That's magnificent. That makes the third one. Oh. Of the large of time. I was debating whether I was going to make the surface with it or not. <laughs> oh. Isn't that something? I mean, how did it survive? A well, ceramic what... piece with all the surge here and this coral and everything. I can hardly believe any of that thing like that would survive first. That's what's incredible. We've been finding a lot of these where the shards are, the coins attached to the inside. Smuggling? Yes. Mm -hmm. Obviously. Oh, As a matter of fact, before, just before we came upon this one, while I was venturing, I came upon another shard and had uh, five coins attached to the wall. On the inside of the shard, of yes. Holy smokes. It's... Hey, Bert! Oh, holy God. Yeah, here I go. Oh, oh, I got so many damn more. coins, I had to put them in two bags. My oh, God, it weighs like ballast. Oh, holy Duke smokes. down here picking them up right and left. Oh. Hey, watch on top. There's a big clump we got out, too. What, a huge oh. clump? Yeah. Uh, man, this is tough. Tough, I can only pull it over the side. Hurry up and empty that bag. I want to go back down. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Hey, silver! <laughs> Lots of Holy it. Holy smokes. Treasure Island. Yeah, I'm just never going to say the same thing. thing. <laughs> this is what I've been waiting for all day. Wow. Something like this. <laughs> yeah. Here's something very interesting. And now, just pulling these out at random. And see, the marks, the uh, yes. mint marks are beautiful on these already. Here are some uh, some eights. We have some eights here. These are Mexican mint. Here is a potosy. 
Uh, you can tell by the uh, the shape and by the thickness. You can feel the yep. difference. That's heavy silver. And oh, you're here, absolutely right. Here's a Mexican four, uh, four real, half of an eight, all OMP, designating the Mexico City Mint. You've heard the expression to use two bits, four bits. That's sure. where it comes from, from these pieces. For heaven's sake. And pieces of eight, Long John Silver had a parrot, didn't he? That, um, <laughs> the pieces yes, of eight. I remember. Wow. Sure this isn't too big for you? I don't think so. I'm, <laughs> I'm learning to grow with it. <laughs> You've got to grow with it. Just roll with the silver. <laughs> it's there we go. It's an old thing now. You could hear them coming in the dawn, when the sea is at peace and all is quiet aboard the work vessel. Always Don Summers and Stan Waterman would be awake to meet them. Humpback whales, 50 feet long, an endless fascination for a Missouri farm boy. Giants, elegant, benevolent, and power. They could be heard beneath the surface as well, where their presence seemed to bathe the reef in alien language. Powerful, yet soothing. They come each spring to the Silver Shoals to bear their calves and to haunt the reef with plaintive songs that seem to reach across the centuries. Listening to their songs, one is aware that there may be a mind in the water. Soon after the humpbacks leave, the reef is given over to other creatures, other minds in the water. With the tomb of the Concepcion now laid bare, each new day begins with a strong sense of purpose. The divers now realize the extent of their discovery, and their concentration is total. Waterman is aware of the excitement, and as he attempts to capture the mood on film, he begins to feel it as well. Each shot is a small adventure. Harry Wyman finds a silver label oxidized to blue-black from the electromagnetic forces of the sea. Another piece of history is released into the present. Waterman finds Jim Nace working intently with a water hose. The former football star handles each artifact with a sensitivity born of respect for the past. A porcelain rice bowl from the Ming period, as intact as the day it was made. Then Jim Nace uncovers a heavy brass object he has never seen before. It is an astrolabe, an ancient navigational instrument worth at least $100,000. Although they have brought up 6,000 coins this day, Nace is about to deliver the single most valuable item thus far recovered from the Concepcion. Early morning, April 6, 1979, San Isidro Air Force Base, a few miles outside Santo Domingo.
As part of its agreement with Bert Weber, the Dominican Republic has promised to provide instant military response to any emergency. Although this time it was only a drill, Bert Weber is acutely aware of the need for such protection. One quick call from this man, Colonel Manuel Montes Arache, and within minutes, this 42-man Dominican frigate positioned on Half Moon Reef would be armed and ready for all comers. And within 20 minutes, these P-51 Mustangs would be overhead. When you are alone and exposed some 85 miles at sea, with millions of dollars worth of treasure on board, such a sight can indeed be gratifying. But no matter how gratifying Weber's success has been, it has brought him to a critical juncture in his career. As president of his own salvage company, he looks forward to a brave new world of treasure hunting, but not without some regret. Anyone can well imagine this is a dream come true for me, finding this wreck. And I've been physically involved very heavily, uh, particularly in the magnetic work and also the diving and salvage, but finding this wreck is just the beginning for Sequest, and we have many more things we wish to do, and I am going to be kind of phased out doing less and less diving as, uh, as this, this moves along. How do you feel about going away from being down there and getting those coins in the hand and perhaps in the office more? Well, after the, the 17 years of really waiting for the big one, uh, you can understand my uh, appreciation of being here and being physically involved. Not only that, as a personality, I'm, I'm a person of action and always have been. And it's, it's I have mixed emotions about it. I know what's essential in, in the business sense of progressively moving on, which we are in many areas, new countries, new wreck sites. But uh, I'll, I'll miss it. Beneath such worldly matters as complex underwater technology, high finance, and even the eventual dollar value of the Concepcion's treasure, there is an inner shape to this story that is not so easily defined. This is a story of a sunken treasure galleon and the men who found her, or rather a breed of men, who some say is fast fading from our midst. While most of us stumble on into an uncertain future, these men choose to come here and revel in the past. Yes, for Bert Weber, Bob Coffey, Duke Long, Don Summers, John Barrier, Billy Fothergill, and all the others. This is not merely a story of sunken treasure and the accumulation of personal wealth. What each will remember above all else is that once upon a time, he held history in the palm of his hand. For young Jim Nace, however, the last dive of a particular day late in May will always burn brightest in his future daydreams. the dust of centuries, a golden chain emerges. It is heavy and of intricate design, as untarnished as the day it sank into the sea. But more than that, it is a glittering connection into the past, perhaps more intimate than all the others. He finds still another chain, lighter and less impressive, but nonetheless fashioned of pure gold. His luck seems endless. In a matter of minutes, Nace and Bob Coffey are back at the work vessel where Bert Weber and the rest of the crew have been cleaning and counting the day's haul. Hey! hey terrible day, Bert! Hey, 
Then it's just the real thing. Have you ever seen a man? Well, they're two trying to see each other. Champagne tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thus far, Jim Nace's discovery remains the centerpiece in the collected treasure of the Concepcion. But the rest is by no means unimpressive. There are tens of thousands of silver coins still to be cleaned, crates full of Ming Dynasty porcelain and Spanish majolica, silver bars, ingots, splashes and wedges, silver candelabras, silver cups, knives, forks and enough artifacts to fill a museum. Soon the treasure would be divided and dispersed to the capitals of wealth around the world. They are to be auctioned off to the highest bidder or sold directly to private collectors. Although its total value would probably not be determined for years, the treasure of the Concepcion is undoubtedly among the richest in history. Some people would call this money, but actually it is much, much more than money. It is the stuff from which dreams are made, and there are tons of it, taken from a grave where it had lain undisturbed for more than three centuries. But this was no gift from the sea. Every piece of eight, every artifact was a hard-won prize wrested from the Silver Shoals by means of technology, research, hard work, and the unshakable faith of one man who dared to fight windmills.